Welcome back to the second reading of the story of Edgar Sawtell. I hope that you went and picked it up. I hope that you were so drawn in with that first section that um, that you wanted to own this yourself. Get your own copy and maybe continue reading. Obviously my uh, readings of it are posted on YouTube and then um, you can access them at any time, but having the book in your hand is ah so much better. It's by David Robleski. I believe it was the first book he he wrote, and wow, wow. And again, I think I told you the first time, if you've ever owned a dog, you're gonna love this book. I. Look, I think my dogs have a secret code. Every now and again, I'll look at them and they'll give me a little wink. I wink back. I don't know about you, but it's like we have some little bond. I have one dog who, she is almost 15 years old. She absolutely cannot hear a thing, but I can point at her and point at what I, where I want her to go, and she does it. She knows my sign language. I can't imagine what she knew with Edgar, but I think we're going to find out. Let's go ahead and uh, jump in. We are on page 36, if you are following along. It's called Signs. What was there to do with such an infant child but worry over him? Gar and Trudy worried that he could never have a voice. His doctors worried that um, you know, that he didn't cough. I'm just setting my timer. And Almondine simply worried whenever the boy was out of her sight, though he never was for long. Quickly enough, they discovered that no one understood a case like Edgar's. Such children existed only in textbooks, and even those were different in a thousand particulars from this baby, whose lips worked when he wanted to nurse whose hands paddled the air when his parents diapered him, who smelled faintly like fresh flour and tasted like the sea, who slept in their arms and woke and compared in puzzlement their faces with the ether of some distant world, silent in contentment and silent in distress. The doctors shone their lights into him and made their guesses, but who lived with him morning and evening? Who set their alarm to check him by moonlight? Who snuck in each morning to find a wide-eyed grub peering up from the crib, skin translucent as onion paper? The doctors made their guesses, but every day Trudy and Gar saw proof of normalcy and strangeness and drew their own conclusions. And all infants need the same simple things. Pup or child, squalling or mute, they clung to that certainty for a while at least. It didn't matter what in him was special and what ordinary. He was alive. What mattered was that he opened his eyes every single morning. Compared to that, silence was nothing. By September, Trudy had had enough of waiting rooms and charts and tests, not to mention the expense and time away from the kennel. All summer, she told herself to wait, that any day her baby would begin to cry and jabber, jabber like other children. Yet the question seemed increasingly dire. Some nights she could hardly sleep for wondering, and if medical science could supply an answer, there might be other ways to know. One evening she told Gar they needed formula, and she bundled up Edgar and put him in the truck and drove to Popcorn Corners. The leaves on the trees were every shade of yellow and red, and crinkled brown disc discards covered the dirt of Town Line Road, swirling in the vortex of the pickup as it passed along. She parked in front of the rickety old grocery and sat looking at the neon open sign glowing orange in the front window. The interior of the place was bright light, uh, brightly lit, but vacant, save for a gray-haired old woman, crane-like, countenance ancient, sitting behind the counter, Ida Payne, the prop proprietor. Inside, a radio played quietly. A fiddle melody was just audible over the rustle of the leaves in the night breeze. Trudy had brought the truck to a halt directly before the big plate glass window 
fronting the store. And Ida Payne had to know Trudy was out there, but the old woman sat like a fixture, her hands folded in her lap, a cigarette burning somewhere out of sight. If Trudy hadn't been afraid someone would come along, she might have waited a very long time in the truck, but she took a breath and tucked Edgar into her arms and walked into the store. Then she didn't know quite what to do. <coughs> so sorry. Let's see. When she realized that the radio had stopped playing, she temporarily lost the ability to speak. Ida Payne looked at her from her perch. She wore oversized glasses that magnified her eyes, and behind the lenses, those eyes blinked and blinked again. Trudy looked at Edgar cradled in her arms and decided that coming in had been a bad idea. She was turning to leave when Ida Payne broke the silence. Let me see, she said. Ida didn't hold out her hands or come around the counter, nor was there a grandmotherly note in her voice. If anything, her tone was incurious and weary, though benign. Trudy stepped forward and laid Edgar on the counter between them, where the wooden surface was worn velvety, velvety from an eternity's caress of tin cans and pickle jars. When she let go, Edgar bicycled his legs and grasped the air as if it were made of some elastic matter none of them could feel. Ida leaned forward and examined him with dilated eyes. Two gray streams of cigarette smoke whistled from her nostrils. Then she lifted one blue-veined hand and extended a pinky that reminded Trudy of nothing so much as the plucked wingtip of a chicken, and she poked the flesh of Edgar's thigh. His eyes widened. Tears welled up in them. From his mouth came the faintest huff. Trudy had watched a dozen doctors prod her son, feeling hardly a tremor, but this she couldn't bear. She reached forward, meaning to reclaim her baby. Wait, Ida said. She bent lower and tipped her head and pressed the avian pinky into the infant's palm. His tiny finger spasm closed around it. Ida Payne stood like that for what seemed hours. Trudy stopped breathing entirely. She l then she let out a gasp and scooped Edgar into her arms and stepped back from the counter. Outside, at the four-way stop, a pair of headlights appeared. Neither Trudy nor Ida moved. The neon open sign darkened, and an instant later, the ceiling fluorescence winked out. In the dark, Trudy could make out Ida's, Ida's crone's silhouette and her hand raised before her, considering her pinky. The headlights resolved into a station wagon, and the station wagon rolled into the dirt parking lot and paused and accelerated back onto the blacktop. No, Ida Payne grunted with some finality. Not ever. He can use his hands. By then, the whine of car tires had faded into the night. Orange worms of plasma began to flux and crawl in the tubes of the open sign. Overhead, the ballast hum and the fluorescence flickered and lit. Trudy waited for some elaboration from Ida, but understood soon enough that she stood in the presence of a terse oracle indeed. That it was all the more Ida Payne had to say. Anything else? A month later, a woman came to visit. Trudy was in the kitchen fixing a late lunch while guard tended a newly whelped litter in the kennel. When the knock came, Trudy walked to the porch where a stout woman waited, dressed in a flowered skirt and a white blouse, her steel gray hair done up in a tightly wound permanent. She gripped her handbag and looked over her shoulder at the kennel dogs raising the alarm. Hello, the woman said with an uncertain smile. I'm afraid you're going to think this very inappropriate. Your dogs certainly do. She smoothed down the front of her skirt. My name is Louisa Wilkes, she continued, and I, well, the fact is I don't know exactly why I'm here. Trudy asked her to come inside, if she didn't mind Almondine. She didn't mind dogs at all, Louisa Wilkes said, not in ones and twos. Mrs. Wilkes settled on the couch and Almondine curled up in front of the bath bassinet where Edgar slept. Something about the prim way she walked and folded her hands when she sat made Trudy think she was a southerner, though she had no accent Trudy could detect. What can I do for you? Trudy said. Well, as I said, I'm not sure. I'm here visiting my nephew and his wife, John and Eleanor Wilkes. Oh yes, of course, Trudy said. She thought the same Wilkes 
The name Wilkes sounded familiar, but hadn't been able to place it. We see Eleanor in town once in a while. She and John look after one of our dogs. Yes, that was very the very first thing I noticed. Your dogs. There Ben is a wonderful animal, very bright eyes, she said, looking at Almondine. Like this one. Same way of peering at you, too, in case. In any case, I talked them into lending me their car for the morning so I could see the countryside. I know it's odd, but I like the quiet of a car when I'm alone in it. A ways back, I found myself at a little store, practically in the middle of nowhere. I hoped they'd sold sandwiches, but they didn't. I bought some crackers and said in a soda, The store is run by the strangest woman. You must be talking about popcorn corners, Trudy said. That's Ida Payne's store. Ida can be a little spooky. So I discovered. After I paid the woman, she told me I wanted to follow the highway a bit farther and take the side road and look for the dogs. Strange, I hadn't asked for directions, and that's the way she put it, too. Not that I should or could, but that I wanted to. She said it through the window screen as I was walking to my car. I asked her what she meant. But she just sat there. I intended to turn back the way I came, but then I was curious. I found the road just off where she said it would be. When I saw your dogs, I... She broke off. Well, that's all there is to tell. I parked on the road, and now here I am, feeling loony for having walked in. Louisa Wilkes looked around the living room, fidgeting with her purse. But I do have the feeling we should talk some more. You're a new mother, she said. She walked to the bassinet, and Trudy joined her. His name is Edgar. The baby was wide awake. He scrunched his eyebrows at the unhappy sight of a woman, not his mother, leaning over him, and he stretched his mouth wide, making silence. The woman frowned and looked at Trudy. Yes, he doesn't use his voice. The equipment's all in there, but when he cries, there's no sound. We don't know why. At this, Louisa Wilkes stood up straight. And how old is he? Just shy of six months. Is there a chance he's deaf? It's very simple to test for. Even in infants, you just clap your hands and see if they flinch. Yes, we know from the start that, that his hearing's fine. When he's in his bassinet and I start to talk, he looks around. Why do you ask? Do you know of another case like his? I'm sure I don't. Mrs. Sawtell, I've never heard of anything like it. What I do know about, well, first of all, I'm not a nurse, much less a must, much less a doctor. I'm glad to hear that. I'm out of patience with doctors, and they've told us all they've told us is what isn't wrong with Edgar, and that amounts to everything besides his voice. They've tested how fast his pupils dilate. They've tested his saliva. They've drawn blood. They've even taken EKGs amazing what they can rule out on a newborn. But I've finally had to draw the line. I won't have my baby tormented all through his infancy. And all you have to do is spend a few minutes with him to know he's a perfectly normal baby. Almondine was up now, scenting the basket and their visitor with equal concern. Mrs. Wilkes looked down at her. Benny is such an extraordinary animal. She said, I've never seen a dog quite so aware of conversation. I could swear he turns toward me when he thinks it's my turn to speak. Yes, Trudy said, they understand more than we give them credit for. Oh, it's more than that. I've been around plenty of dogs. Dogs that lie on your lap and fall asleep. Dogs that bark at every stranger who walks past. Dogs that crouch on the floor and watch you like a long lost bow. But I have never seen a dog behave that way. Louisa Wilkes looked at Edgar in the bassinet. Then she turned and lifted her hands and moved them through the air, looking intently at Trudy. Her motions were fluid and expressive and entirely silent. She paused long enough to be sure that Trudy realized what she had seen, even if she hadn't understood its meaning. What I just said is, I'm the child of two profoundly deaf parents. Another swift flight of hands. I'm not deaf myself, but I teach sign at a school for the deaf. And I'm wondering, Mrs. Sawtell, what will happen if it turns out that your boy lacks the power of speech, but nothing else? Trudy noticed how deftly Louisa Wilkes phrased her questions. A steeliness that emerged the moment she signed, something almost fierce. Trudy liked that. Louisa Wilkins wasn't beating around the bush. 
and Trudy could hardly have forgotten Ida Payne's pronouncement that autumn night. He can use his hands. At the time, Trudy thought Ida Payne had meant that Edgar would only be able to use his hands, that he was destined for menial work, which Trudy knew was wrong. The whole episode had made her angry, and she chalked it up to foolishness, her own. She'd never mentioned the incident to Gar. Now Trudy began to suspect she'd mis misunderstood Ida Payne. He'll make do, Mrs. Wilkes. I think we'll find out that there's nothing else different about Edgar. Perhaps as he grows, his voice will come. Since we don't know why it's gone in the first place, there's no way to tell if, it, if this is temporary. He's never uttered a sound, not even once. No, never. And the doctors, what did they tell you to do while you're waiting to find out if your son might or might not find a voice? That's been so discouraging. They told me only the most obvious things to talk to him, which I do. So if he has a choice, he'll imitate his mother. Did they suggest any exercises, anything you might do with him? None, really. They speculated on what we might do in a few years if nothing changes. But for now, just watch him. If, when something changes, we go from there. Hearing this, Mrs. Wilkes' reserve, rapidly diminishing ever since the topic had turned to deafness, dropped away entirely. Mrs. Sawtell, listen to me now. I don't mean to presume anything, and for all I know, what I'm about to tell you, you've already read or been told. Though from the sound of it, the doctors you've seen have been woefully ignorant, which would not surprise me at all. You cannot begin too early to bring the power of language to children whose grasp may be precarious. No, no one can say for sure when children begin to learn language, that is, we do not know how early in their lives they understand that they can talk and should talk, that through speech they will lead fulfilling lives. There is, on the other hand, evidence that by the age of one year, the gift of language begins slipping away unless it is nurtured. This has happened to deaf children throughout history, and it is quite a terrible thing. Children considered retarded and left to fend for themselves. I'm talking about perfectly intelligent, capable children abandoned because they did not know that sound existed. How could they? By the time someone recognized that they lacked only hearing, they were handicapped forever. But everything you say applies to children who can't hear, not to children who can't make sound. But there's no doubt that Edgar can hear. But what about speech? A person communicates by giving as well as taking, by expressing what is inside. Infants learn this by crying. They learn that drawing attention to themselves in even the most primitive way gains, gains them warmth and food and comfort. I worry about your child, Mrs. Sawtell. I wonder how he'll learn these things. Let me tell you about myself for a moment. When I was born, my own parents were faced with a dilemma. How could they teach me to speak? They had not learned it until it was far too late in their teens, and so they had mastered everything but the production of intelligible speech, and now they had a daughter who they wanted more than anything in the world to speak normally. What did they do? They assumed that I was learning even when I seemed to be doing nothing. They played records with conversations, though they couldn't hear anything themselves. They bought a radio and asked their hearing friends to tell them which stations to tune in and when. They watched my mouth to see if I was making sounds. They arranged for me to spend time with people who could play with me and speak to me. In short, Mrs. Sawtell, they made sure that verbal language was available to me in every way they could imagine. But there must have been more to it than that. How did they respond when you spoke your first words? How did they encourage you when they couldn't hear you speak? Mrs. Wilkes talked then about the readiness of babies to learn language, how impossible it was to prevent so long as examples were available, how isolated twins sometimes invented private languages, and went on for quite some time. She had worked with both deaf children and the hearing children of deaf parents, she said, and there was a simple principle. The baby wanted to communicate. It would learn whatever was given as an example, whether English, French, German, Chinese, or sign. As a child, she had learned to sign as well as speak, almost effortlessly. 
This last point, she said, was most significant for the Sawtell baby. But how can I teach him to sign? Trudy said, I don't know how myself. Then you will learn together, Mrs. Wilkes said. At first, you only need to know enough to talk with Edgar in the simplest ways. Which are? Which are to tell him you love him. To say, here is food. To name things. Dog. Bird. Daddy. Mama. Sky. Cloud. Just like any child. Show him how to ask for things he wants by moving his hands in that sign. Show him how to ask for more of whatever he wants. And here she bounced the fingertips of both hands together as she talked. This is more. Their conversation went on late into the evening. When Gar came in from the kennel, Mrs. Wilkes began demonstrating the basics. She said she could explain a few signs and straightforward syntax in an evening. And she began with simple words and simple sentences. She showed them a subject verb, verb object sentence. Trudy loves Gar. She explained the miraculous way in which pronouns are used. She demonstrated an adjective. Trudy was mesmerized repeating the signs and following Mrs. Wilkes' corrections studiously. Guard tried as well, though he lacked Trudy's coordination and grace. It was near midnight before the woman left, far past the time when they usually went to sleep. Edgar had roused several times during the evening, and when they took him up, Mrs. Wilkes demonstrated how to say food and move Edgar's hands. This was harder, since it required performing the sign backward, but it was possible and Trudy understood the enormous leverage that practice gives the determined trainer. Edgar. This will be his earliest memory. Red light, morning light. High ceiling canted overhead. Lazy click of toenails on wood. Between the honey-colored slats of the crib, a whiskery muzzle slides forward until its cheeks pull back and a row of dainty front teeth bear themselves in a ridiculous grin. The nose quivers, the velvet snout dimples. All the house is quiet. Be still, stay still. Fine, dark muzzle fur, black nose, leather of lacework creases, comma of nostrils flexing with each breath. A breeze shushes up the field and pillows the curtains inward. The apple tree near the kitchen window caresses the house with a tick tickety tick tick. As slowly as he can, he exhales, feigning sleep, but despite himself, his breath hitches. At once, the muzzle knows he is awake. It snorts, angles right, then left, withdraws. Outside the crib, Almondine's forequarters appear. Her head is reared back, her ears cocked forward. A cherry brindled eye peers back at him. Whoosh of her tail. Be still. Stay still. The muzzle comes hunting again. Tunnels beneath his blanket. Below the farmers and pigs and chicks and cows died into the cotton world. His hand rises on fingers and spider walks across the surprise farmyard residence to challenge the intruder. It becomes a bird hovering before their eyes. Thumb and index fingers squeeze the crinkled black nose. The pink of her tongue darts out, but the bird flies away before Almondine can lick it. Her tail is swishing harder now. Her body sways, her breath envelops him. He tugs the blackest whisker on her chin, and this time her tongue catches the palm of his hand ever so slightly. He pitches to his side, rubs his hand across his blanket, blows a breath in her face. Her ears flick back. She stomps a foot. He blows again, and she withdraws and bows and whoops low in her chest, quiet and deep, the boom of an uncontainable heartbeat. Hearing it, he forgets and presses his face against the rails to see her, all of her, take her inside him with his eyes, and before he can move, she smears his tongue across his nose and forehead. He claps a hand to his face, but it's too late. She's away, spinning, biting her tail, dancing in the modded sunlight that spills through the, the window glass. Bouncing on his mother's hip as she walks down the aisle of the kennel, dogs rush through the canvas flaps in the barn wall, look at him, take his scent, her voice sing-song as she calls to them. 
his father sitting at the kitchen table, paper strewn before them, pictures of dogs, his father's voice quiet in his ear, talking through a line cross, the corner of a pedigree pinched between his fingers. Running through the yard, past the milk house, throwing the fence gate closed before Almondine can catch him, he crouches in the tall weeds and watches. She loves to jump. Her stride draws up and she sails over the fence. In a moment, she's next to him, panting. He clenches his fist and mocks, scowls. When she looks away, he bolts again. The weeds rush together behind him and then he's in the orchard, a monkey crawling along a branch, the one place she cannot follow, dangling a hand to taunt her. All at once, the world spins. When he hits the ground, a thump sounds in his chest. He begins to cry, but the only sound is Almondine's barking, and after a moment, the kennel dogs. On the farthest apple tree hangs a tire, its rope hairy and moth brown. He's been told to stay away, but forgotten why. He worms his shoulders through both circles of the rubber rim, twists, pumps his leg. The apple trees tilt crazily around him. It takes a minute for the bees to condense from shadow and sunlight, and then he is trapped in the careening tire, and they sting him once on the neck, once on his arm, hot points of light. Almondine snaps at the air, yelps, brushes a paw across her face, and they then they are running to the house. The porch door slams behind them. They wait to see if the bees will keep coming, growing thick against the screen. For a moment, Edgar almost believes the bees never existed, then the stings begin to throb. Wandering through the kennel, holding a book, Winnie the Pooh, he opens a whelping pen, sits. The puppies surge through the underbrush of loose straw, kicking up fine white dust as they come along. He captures them between his legs and reads to them, hands in motion before their upturned muzzles. The mother comes over and they peep like chicks when they see her. One by one, she carries them back to the whelping box, and they hang back in beans shaped from her mouth. When black and beans shaped from her mouth. When she is finished, she stands over them, looking at Edgar in reproach. They wanted to hear, he signs at her, but the mother won't settle with her pups until he leaves. Winnie the Pooh is a good story for pups. If only she would let him tell it. His father, reading to him at bedtime, voice quiet, lamplight yellow on the lenses of his glasses. The story is the Jungle Book. Edgar wants to fall asleep with Mowgli and Bagheera still in his mind, for the story to cross from the lamplight into his dreams. His father's voice stops, and he sits up. More, he signs, fingertips together. His father starts the next page. He lies back and moves his hands through the air to the sound of his father's voice thinking about words, the shape of words. He's sitting on the gray leatherette cushion of, at the doctor's bench and holding his mouth wide open. The doctor's face is closed, looking into him. Then the doctor puts alphabet tiles on a table. The doctor asks him to spell apple, but there's only one P and he can't do it right. The doctor turns to a notepad and writes something down while he tries to turn the B upside down so it will be right. I'd like him to stay for a few days, the doctor says. His mother shakes her head and frowns. The doctor presses a buzzing flashlight-shaped thing against his throat. Breathe out, he says. Pull your lips back. Touch your tongue to the roof of your mouth. Make a circle with your lips. Edgar follows his instructions and a word floats out of his mouth. Hello! But the sound is hideous. It flies against a pane of glass. Don't do that! The doctor doesn't understand at first. Edgar used the letter board and goes slow for him. On the way home, they drink back black cows at the dog and suds on his mother face and expression. Sorrow, anger. Sitting in the whelping pen, watching a new litter of puppies squirm. At five days old, they are too young to name, but this has become his job. One of the pups is trying to climb over the others, pushing them aside to nurse. He is a bully. His name will be Hector, Edgar decides. Choosing names is hard. At night, he discusses it with his mother and father. He's very young, and he's only now begun using his dictionary to find names and note them in the margins. 
The doctor brings in someone new, a man with a beard and black hair that falls to his shoulders. The man signs hello to him, a flick of his hand off his forehead, then asks him something, signing faster than Edgar has ever seen, one sign melting into another. Too fast, he signs. He grabs the man's wrists and makes him do it again. The man turns to the doctor, speaks a few words, and the doctor nods. You sound funny, Edgar signs. The man laughs, and even that is odd. Do I, he signs. I'm deaf. I've never heard my voice. Edgar stares at him as if he didn't know a deaf person would look just the same. From behind the man, his mother frowns and shakes her head. How old are you, the man signs. Almost four, he says. He holds up four fingers, and with his thumb tucked in, bumps the eye hand twice against his heart. You're very good. I couldn't sign like you when I was four. I'm backward from you. I can hear okay. Yes, it's good. We both sign. Can you sign with your dogs? Mine don't always understand. My dog never understands, the man signs, smiling. Almondine understands when I say this, said Edgar, and he signs something that only he and Almondine know. They watch Almondine approach. The man pauses and looks at the doctor. Standing in the aisle of the barn, his father sits in one of the pens with the mother, stroking her ears. The mother is so old, even her tail shows gray. She lies on her side, panting. His father points to the ceiling beams running crossways to the main aisle and tells him they came from trees Schultz felled in the woods behind the barn. The first spring leaves sprouted from those beams, he said, and Edgar sees for the first time the knots and scrapes, sees the tree hidden in each beam, and sees all well Schultz and his ponies heaving them up through the field. A string of bare light bulbs run the length of the aisle, one descending from every other beam. Hang on, gorgeous, his father says, turning back to the mother. When Dr. Papineau arrives, Edgar leads him into the barn. Over here, Paige, Edgar's father says. Dr. Papineau enters the pen and kneels. He runs his hands over the mother's belly and presses the coin tip of a stethoscope to her chest. Then he walks to his car and fetches a satchel. Edgar's father turns to him. Go up to the house now, he says. From the satchel, Dr. Papineau lifts a bottle and a syringe. Two rolling hills span the south field, one near their yard, one further out. There's a rock pile in the middle and a small grove of birches and a cross. Waves of hay lie over in the August breeze. Edgar plunges through the field, trying to lose Almondine. Always their game. He cuts around the rocks, dives under a birch, and lies as quietly as he can. He peers at the white cross, standing alone between him and the yard, and he wonders again what it means. It's so simple and straight and square, and sometimes not too long before, it is taken on a fresh, brilliant white coat of paint. Then the stalks of hay part, and Almondine trots up, panting. She flops down and presses a paw to his chest as if to say, Don't do that again! too hot for those games. But he jumps up and races away, and she's there beside him, mouth open in a smile. So often she runs ahead. So often he finds her waiting when he arrives. A late spring afternoon, Edgar and his mother sit in the living room. Their television shows gray static, and, she's, and the speakers hiss. All the shades are raised. Clouds like bruises scud over the fields. Outside a sizzle flash. There's a snap from the kitchen as sparks fly from the electric sockets. He counts one, two, three, until the thunder rolls back at them from the hills. It's the iron in the ground. It draws the lightning, his father has said. See how red the dirt is? This is where the iron range begins. The pines flap their branches in the gusts, swimming in the wind. He walks to the window to see if the treetops actually pierce the clouds. A tatter of white steam passes over the thrashing treetops, sliding counter to the motion of the storm. Come away from the window, his mother says. Splats of rain hit the glass, and outside an instant of brilliant light and sparks leap from the kitchen outlets again. Thunder never arrives, and the extended silence is eerie. Was that cold lightning? Probably. There's hot lightning and cold lightning, she's told him. Only hot lightning makes thunder. 
The difference is important. A person hit by hot lightning is fried on the spot. A person struck by cold lightning walks away without a mark. His mother sits on the chair and watches the clouds. I wish your father would come in here. I'll go get him. No, you won't. You'll stay right here with me. She gives him a look that means no kidding around. I'm taller than you now, he signs, trying to make her relax. Lately, he's begun to tease her about being the shortest in the family. She gives him a tight lip smile and turns back to the television. He doesn't quite know what they should be looking for, just that it'll be obvious from a Reader's Digest article he learned about the Weller method, which they are now performing. The television is tuned to channel two and dimmed until the static is nearly black. We just keep watching, she should explain. If a tornado comes near, the screen turns white from the electrical field. They divided their attention between the jitter on the tube and the advancing shelf of cloud. His mother has an endless source of meteorolo meteorological anecdotes, ball lightning, tornadoes, hurricanes, but today, as during all the worst storms, a haunted look occupies her face, and he knows those stories royal inside her like the clouds in the sky. The television fizzles and crackles. Still, she is okay until Almadine comes over and leans against her for reassurance. That's it, she says. Down we go. The basement stairs are on the back porch. Through the screen door, they see his father standing in the doorway of the barn. His hair tousled by the wind. He's leaning against the jam, almost casually, his face turned skyward. Gar, his mother shouts, come in, we're going to the basement. I'll stay here, he calls back. The wind makes his voice tinny and small. It's going to be a wild one. You go on. She shakes her head and ushers them down the stairs. Shoo, shoo, she says, let's go. Almondine plunges down the steps before them. There's a latch door at the bottom and she waits with nose pressed to the crack, sniffing. Once inside, they squint at the clouds through the dusty basement transom windows. No rain is falling, only drips and blobs of water blown sideways through the air. What does he think he'll accomplish out there, she says, fuming. All he wants to do is watch the storm. You're right, he just stands in the doorway like that. The dogs can take care of themselves. It's having him out there that stirs them up, as if he could protect the barn. It's ridiculous. Lightning plunges into the field nearby. Thunder shakes the house. Oh no, his mother says. The last strike has started Edgar's heart smashing too. He dashes up the cement stairs for a look, and as he reaches the top, there's a blue-white flash, dazzling bright, and a bomb sound. Then he's flying down the stairs again, but not before he's seen for himself, his father still standing with one hand on the barn door, braced as if daring the storm to touch him. And it's clear that then that everything so far has been a prelude. The wind blows not in fits and gusts, but with a sustained howl that makes Edgar wonder when the windows will shatter from the pressure. Almondine whines, and he draws his hand along her back and crop. A timber, a timber groans from inside the walls. His mother has herded them to the southwest corner of the basement. Anecdotally, the safest if a tornado lifts the house off its foundation, Wizard of Oz style. The wind blows for a long time, so long it becomes laughable. And strangely, with the gale at full force, sunlight begins to stream through the transom windows. That is the first sign the storm will pass. Only later does the solid roar of air slacken in descending octaves until all that remains is an ironic summer breeze. Sit tight, his mother says. Edgar can see her thinking, eye of the storm. But his father's voice echoes across the yard. That was a doozy. Outside, it is impossible not to look first at the sky, where a field of summer cumulus and innoc innocuous and white stretches westward. The storm clouds glower above the treetops across the road. The house and barn seem untouched. The pine trees stand quiet and whole, the apple trees intact at first glance until he notices that every blossom has been stripped bare, every petal swept against the wind. Hardly a drop of rain has fallen, and the air is dusty and choking. Edgar and Almondine circulate through the house, plugging in the stove, the toaster, the dryer, the air conditioner in the living room. The mailman pauses his car beside the mailbox and drives off with a wave. Edgar jogs up the driveway to fetch the contents, 
a single letter hand addressed to his father. The postmark says Portsmouth, Virginia. He's reaching for the handle on the porch door when his father's shout rises from behind the barn. The four of them stand in the weeds behind the barn, gazing upward. A ragged patch of shingles, the size of the living room, the size of the living room floor hangs from the eaves like a flap of crusty skin thick with nails. A third of the roof lies exposed, gray and bare. Before their eyes, the barn has become the weathered hull of a ship, upturned. But what astonishes them, what makes them stand with jaws agape, is this. Near the peak, a dozen roofing boards have detached from the rafters and curled back in long, crazy-looking hoops that stop just short of making a circle. The most spectacular corkscrew up and away, as if a giant hand had reached down and rolled them between its fingers. Where the boards have peeled back, the ribs of the barn show through, roughly joined and mortised by Schultz so long ago. The breeze rattles the roofing boards like bones. A thin alphabet of yellow straw dust escapes from the mow and flies over the barn's long spine. After a while, Edgar remembers the letter, lifts it absently, and holds it out to his father. This chapter is called Every Nook and Cranny. Early morning, a week after the storm had inflicted its peculiar damage on the barn roof, Edgar and Almondine stood atop the bedroom stairs, boy and dog, surveying twelve descending treads, their surfaces crusted by smooth sanded knots and shot with cracks wide enough to stand a nickel in and varnished so thickly by Schultz that all but the well-worn centers shone with a maroon gloss treacherous for people in stockinged feet and unnerving to the four-legged. What it most impressed Edgar was not their appearance, but their gift for vocalization. Everything from groans to nail squeals and many novelties besides, depending on the day of the week or the humidity of what book you happen to be carrying. The challenge that morning was to descend in silence, not just Edgar, but Almondine and Edgar together. He knew the pattern of quiet spots by heart. Far right on the twelfth and eleventh step. Tenth and ninth, safe anywhere. The eighth, good on the left, and the sixth and fifth, quiet in the middle. A tricky switch from the far right of the fourth to left of middle on the third, and so on. But the seventh step had never let them by without a grunt or a rifle shot crack. He'd lost interest in the riddle of it for a long time, but the sight of the barn's demented roofing planks had reminded him that wood in all shapes could be mysterious, and he'd resolved to try again. He negotiated the first four steps and turned. Here, he signed, pointing to a place on the tread for Almondine. Here, here. Each time she placed a broad, padded foot where his fingers touched the tread, and silence ensued. Then he stood on the eighth step, the brink, with Almondine's, Almondine nosing his back and waiting. He swung his foot over the seventh tread like a dowser looking for, for water. Toward the right side, he knew the thing creaked. In the middle, it let out a sound like a rust seized door hinge. His foot hovered and drifted over the wood. Finally, it came to a stop above an owl-eyed swirl of gray near the wall on the left. He carefully settled his weight onto the tread. Silence. He stepped quickly down to the sixth and fifth and turned back and picked up Almondine's foot and stroked it. He tapped the owl eye. Here. She stepped down. Yes, good girl. In time, they stood at the base of the stairs together, having arrived without a sound. A quiet moment of exaltation passed between them as they headed for the kitchen. He didn't intend to tell anyone he'd found the way down. They were a small family living in a small farmhouse with no neighbors and hardly any time or space to themselves. If he managed to share one secret with his father and a different one with his mother and yet another with Almondine, the world felt that much larger. They didn't say where his father was going, only that it was a long day's drive before he would return with Claude. It was late May and school was in session, though barely, and when he asked to go along, he knew the answer would be no. That morning, he and Almondine and his mother watched the truck top the hill on Town Line Road, and then they walked to the barn for morning chores. 
a pile of second-hand LPs and an old suitcase-style record player occupied a lower shelf of the workshop. Two pennies had been taped to the needle arm covering the lightning bolt Z in the zenith embossed in the fluted metal. Through the speaker grill, a person could make out the filaments glowing igneous orange in their silver nipple tubes. The, his mother unsleeved one of her favorite records and set it on the turntable. Edgar cleaned the kennel to the sound of Patsy Klein's voice. When he finished, he found his mother in the whelping room. She was holding a pup in the air in front of her and examining it and singing and signing. Nope. Singing under her breath how she was crazy for trying. Sorry, the words are so close. And I know that signing is a big thing in this book. She was singing under her breath how she was crazy for trying, crazy for crying, and crazy for loving it. The truck was still gone when he got off the school bus that afternoon. His mother enlisted his help retrieving sheets from the clothesline. Don't they smell great, she said, holding the fabric to her face. It's so nice to hang them out again. They tramped up the stairs to the spare room located across the hallway from Edgar's bedroom. That morning it had been brimming with stacks of dog world and field and stream and a menagerie of cast-off furniture and broken appliances and many other familiars. A rollaway bed with a pinstripe mattress, closed up clam style, a set of seat-split kitchen chairs, two brass floor lamps teetering like long-legged birds, and most of all, innumerable cross-flap cardboard boxes which had spent long afternoons digging through, hoping to unearth an old photo album. They had photographs of every dog they'd ever raised, but none of themselves. Perhaps they thought one of those boxes held some faded image that he would reveal how his mother and father had met. His mother swung the door open with a flourish. What do you think? she asked. I'll give you a hint. Personally, I can't believe the difference. She was right. Their room was transformed. The boxes were gone, the window glass sparkled, the wooden floor had been swept and mopped, and the fold-away bed had been laid out flat, and at its head a little table he had never seen before acted as a nightstand. A warm breeze sucked the freshly laundered curtains against the screen and blew them out again, and somehow the whole room smelled like a lemon orchard. Great, he signed. It's never looked so good. Of course not. It's been filled with junk. Know what the best part is? Your father said that this used to be Claude's room when he was growing up. Can you imagine that? When you get that side, she billowed a sheet over the mattress, and they, t and they tucked their way up from the foot of the bed. Each of them stuffed a pillow into a pillowcase. His mother kept looking at him as they worked. Finally, she stopped and stood up. What's bothering you? Nothing. I don't know. He paused and looked around. What, what did you do with everything? Well, I found some nooks and crannies. A lot of it I put in the basement. I thought you and your father could cart these old chairs to the dump this weekend. Then she slipped into sign, which she performed unhurriedly and with great precision. Do you want me? Do you want to ask me something about Claude? Have I ever met him, him when I was little? No, I've only met him once. He enlisted in the Navy the year before I met your father, and he's been he's only been back once for your grandfather's funeral. Why did he join the Navy? I don't know. Sometimes people enlist to see more of the world. Your father says Claude didn't always get along with your grandfather. That's another reason people enlist, or maybe none of those things. How long is he staying? A while, until he finds a place of his own. He's been gone a long time. He might not stay at all. This might be too small of a place for him now. Does he know about the dogs? She laughed. He grew up here. He probably doesn't know them like your father does. Not anymore. He sold his share of the kennel to your father when your grandfather died. Edgar nodded, and after they were finished, he waited until his mother was occupied and then carried the lamps up from the basement to his room. He sat them on opposite ends of his bookshelves, and he and Almondine spent the afternoon pulling books off the shelves and leafing through them. It was long after dark when the headlights of the truck swept the living room walls. Edgar and his mother and Almondine waited on the back porch while his father turned the truck around by the barn. The porch light glinted off the glass of the windshield and the truck rolled to a stop. His father got out of the cab, his expression serious, even cross, though it softened when he looked up at them. 
He gave a small, silent wave, then walked to the rear of the truck and opened the topper and lifted out a lone suitcase. At first, Claude stayed inside the cab, visible only in silhouette. He craned his neck to look around. Then the passenger door swung open, and he stepped out, and Edgar's father walked up beside him. It was impossible not to make comparisons. His father's brother wore an ill-fitting serge suit, in which he looked uneasy and shabbily formal. From the way it hung on him, he was thinner of, the thinner of the two. Claude's hair was black, where, th where his father's was peppered. He stood with a slightly stooped posture, perhaps from the long drive, which made it hard to tell who was taller. And Claude didn't wear glasses. In all, Edgar's first impression was of some quite different, someone quite different from his father. But then Claude turned to look at the barn and in profile, the similarities jumped out the shape of their noses and chins and foreheads, and when they walked into the side yard, their gates were identical, as if their bodies were hinged in precisely the same way. Edgar had a sudden strange thought. That's what it's like to have a brother. Looks about the same, Claude was saying. His voice was deeper than Edgar's father and gravelly. I guess I expected things to have changed some. There's more difference than you think, his father said. Edgar could hear the irritation in his tone from across the yard. We repainted a couple of years back, but we stayed with white. The sashes on the two front windows rotted out, so we replaced them with that big picture window. You'll see that when we get inside. And a lot of the wiring and plumbing's been fixed, stuff you can't see. That's new, Claude said, nodding at the pale green LP gas cylinder beside the house. Yeah, we got rid of the coal furnace almost ten years ago, his father said. He put his hand lightly on Claude's back, and his voice sounded friendly again. Come on, let's go in. We can look around later. He steered Claude toward the porch. When they reached the steps, Claude went up first. Edgar's mother held the door, and Claude stepped through and turned. Hello, Trudy, he said. Hello, Claude, she said. Welcome home. It's nice to have you here. She hugged him briefly, squeezing up her shoulders in an embrace that was both friendly and slightly formal. Then she stepped back, and Edgar felt her hand on his shoulder. Claude, meet Edgar, she said. Claude shifted his gaze from Trudy and held out his hand. Edgar shook it, though awkwardly. He was surprised at how hard Claude squeezed, how it made him aware of the bones in his hand, and how callous Claude's palms were. Edgar felt like he was gripping a hand made of wood. Claude looked up at him and down. Pretty good size, aren't you? It wasn't exactly what Edgar expected him to say. Before he could reply, Claude's gaze shifted again, and this time to Almandine, who stood swinging her tail in anticipation. And this is? Almandine. Claude knelt, and it was clear at once that he had been around dogs a long time. Instead of petting Almandine or scratching her rough, he held out his hand, knuckles first, for her to sniff. Then he puckered his lips and whistled a quietly hummed tweedle, high and low at the same time. Almondine sat up straight and cocked her head left and right. Then she stepped forward and scented Claude thoroughly. When Edgar looked up, his father had a look of shocked recollection on his face. Hey, girl, Claude said, what a beauty. Only after Almondine had finished taking his scent did Claude touch her. He stroked her withers and scratched her on the chest behind her elbow and ran his hand along her belly. She closed up her mouth and arched her back in a gesture of tolerant satisfaction. Man, it's been... Claude seemed at a loss for words. He kept stroking Almondine's coat. He swallowed and took a breath and stood up. I'd forgotten what they're like. It's been a long time since I could just run my hand over a dog like that. There was an awkward silence, and then Edgar's father led Claude up to the revitalized spare room. They'd waited dinner, and Edgar set the table while his mother pulled the ham out of the refrigerator and cut up leftover potatoes to fry. They worked in silence, listening to the talk, as though to make up for his earlier comment. Claude pointed out differences, large and small, between the way things looked and the way he remembered them. When they came downstairs, the two men stood in the wide passageway between the kitchen and the living room. How about dinner? his mother asked. That'd be fine, Claude said. He looked pale suddenly, like someone troubled by something he had seen, or some memory newly dredged up, and not a happy one. No one spoke for a time. Edgar's mother glanced over at them. Just a second, she said. Hold it. You two stay there. Edgar, go stand by your father. Go, go. 
He walked to the doorway. She stepped away from the frying pan and let the potatoes sizzle and put her hands on her hips and squinted as if eyeing a litter of pups to pick out the troublemaker. Good God, sawtell men look alike, she said, shaking her head. You three were stamped out of the same mold. Evidently, she saw three self-conscious smiles in return, for she burst out laughing, and for the first time since Claude arrived, things began to feel relaxed. By the time the meal was finished, Claude's haunted look had softened. Twice, he stepped onto the porch and lit a cigarette and blew smoke through the screen. Edgar sat at the table and listened to the talk until late in the night, about the kennel, the house, even stories about Edgar himself. He taught Claude a couple of signs, which Claude promptly forgot. Almondine began to lean against the newcomer, newcomer when he scratched her, and Edgar was glad to see it. He knew how much the gesture relaxed people. He sat and listened for a long time until his mother pressed her hand on her forehead, on his forehead, and told him that he was asleep. Vague recollection of stumbling upstairs in his dreams that night had stayed at the table. Claude spoke in a voice low and quiet, his face divided by a rippling line of cigarette smoke, his words a senseless jumble. But when Edgar looked down, he found himself standing in a whelping pen, surrounded by a dozen pups, wrestling and chewing one another, and then, just as he lapsed into deep, blank sleep, they stood by the creek, and one by one the pups waded into the shallow water and were swept away. Edgar opened his eyes in the dark. Almondine stood silhouetted near the window, drawing the deep breaths that meant she was fixated on something fascinating or alarming. He clambered out of bed and knelt beside her and crossed her, his forearms on the window sill. Almondine swept her tail and nosed him and turned back to the view. At first he saw nothing out of the ordinary. The maple tree stood freshly leafed out just beyond the porch, its foliage back under the yellow glow of the yard light high in the orchard. No commotion had erupted in the kennel. The dogs weren't barking in their runs. The shadow of the house blanketed the garden, and he half expected to see a deer there, poaching seedlings, a common trespass in summer, and one Almondy regularly woke him for. Not until Claude moved did Edgar realize his uncle had been leaning against the trunk of the maple. He wore jeans and a flannel shirt that belonged to Edgar's father, and in his hand a bottle glinted. He lifted it to his mouth and swallowed. The way he held it in front of him afterwards suggested contents, both precious and rare. Then Claude walked to the double doors fronting the barn. A heavy metal bar was tipped against them, their custom whenever a storm might come through. Claude stood considering this arrangement. Instead of opening the doors, he rounded the silo and disappeared. From the back runs, a volley of barks rose, then quieted. A few moments later, Claude appeared at the south end of the barn, hunkered down beside the farthest run. His tweedling whistled, floated, whistle floated through the night. One of the mothers pressed through a canvas flap and trotted forward. Claude scratched her through the wire. He moved down the line of runs until he had visited every dog, and then he returned to the front and set the brace bat aside and opened the door. He had walked in directly. A stranger, the dogs would have made a ruckus, but now when the kennel lights came on, there were a few querfulous whoops, and then silence. The door swung shut, and Edgar and Almondine were left watching a yard devoid of all but shadow. The small workroom window began to glow. A moment later, Patsy Klein's voice echoed from inside, and after a few bars, the melody warbled and stopped. Roger Miller launched into King of the Road. He had just begun to describe the two hours of pushing broom brought when he, too, was cut off. There followed a swell of orchestral music, then some big band number. The progression continued, each song playing just long enough to get rolling before it was silenced. Then the music stopped. Almondine huffed at the quiet. Edgar pulled on his jeans and picked up his tennis shoes. The lamp in the spare room cast a dim glow into the hall, and he swung the door back and looked inside. The line-dried sheets were firmly tucked under the mattress. The pillows lay plumped on the head of the railway bed. The only signs Claude had been there at all were his battered suitcase, splayed on the open floor and his suit pulled beside it. The suitcase was nearly empty. 
They descended the stairs. Edgar had to guess at the position of the owl eye in the dark, but they reached the bottom in perfect silence and slipped out the back porch door and trotted to the barn. He pressed an eye to the crack between the double doors. When he saw no movement, he returned to la the latch and slipped through the doors and into the barn with Almadine close behind. A few dogs stood in their pens, most lay curdled in the straw, all of them watching. Nearby, the workshop door stood open. At the distant end of the kennel, the lights in the medicine room blazed. It was as if Claude had inspected everything and left. And Edgar walked to the whelping rooms and cracked open the door and looked inside. Then he and Almondine climbed again silently the stairs along the back wall of the workshop. At the top was an unlit plywood vestibule with a door that prevented winter drafts from rushing down. They stood in the shadows and looked into the mow. Four bare bulbs glowed in their sockets along the rafters. The massive stack of straw bales at the rear of the mow, directly beneath the hole in the roof, was covered with tarps in case it rained. Loose straw and a scattering of yellow bales covered the mow floor. Fly lines ran from cleats in the front wall through pulleys in the rafters and ended in snaps that dangled a few feet above the floor. Claude lay in the middle of it all, on a hastily improvised bed of bales, one hand hanging slackly to the floor, palm up, fingers half curled beside a liquor bottle. Between each of his breaths, a long pause. Edgar almost turned and led Almondine down the stairs again, but at that moment Claude let out a quiet, quiet snore, and Edgar decided, as long as Claude was asleep anyway, they could work their way along the front wall to get a better look at him. They edged out. Edgar sat on a bale of straw. Claude's chest rose and fell. He snorted and scratched his nose and mumbled. They moved one bell closer. Another snore, loud enough to echo in the cavernous space. Then Edgar and Almondine stood over Claude. The black hair, the face so deeply lined. Edgar was pondering again the differences between his father and his uncle when, without opening his eyes, Claude spoke. You people know you got a hole in your roof here, he said. Edgar wasn't sure what startled him more, the fact that Claude was awake or that he had begun to smile before he had opened his eyes. <coughs> There's our timer, so we'll finish up this chapter. Edgar, <laughs> Almondine bolted with a quiet woof. Edgar sprawled backward and countered a bale of straw and plopped down. Claude yawned and sat up. He set his feet on the mow floor and noticed the liquor bottle. An expression of pleasant surprise crossed his features. He picked it up and looked at the two of them and shrugged. Going away present from some friends. Don't ask me how they got it. It's supposed to be impossible. He lifted the bottle to his mouth for a long, languorous drink. He s seemed to be in no rush to say more, and Edgar sat and tried not to stare. After a while, Claude looked back at him. It's pretty late. Your parents know you're out here. Edgar shook his head. I didn't think so. But on the other hand, I can understand it. I mean, some joker shows up and wanders out to your kennel in the middle of the night. You want to know what's what, right? I'd have done the same thing. In fact, your father and I used to be pretty good at sneaking out of the house. Regular Houdinis. Claude mused on this for a second. Getting back in used to be a whole lot harder. Did you use the window or go through the... Oh, never mind, he said, breaking off when his gaze shifted to Almondine. I guess you snuck out the back. The old tried and true. You figured out the way off the porch roof yet? No. Your dad didn't show you? No. Well, he wouldn't. You'll figure it out on your own anyway. And when you do, remember that your old dad and I blazed that particular trail. Claude looked around at the mow. Maybe a lot else is different, but this barn is just how I remembered it. Your dad and I knew every nook and cranny in this place. We hid cigarettes up here, liquor even. We used to sneak up for a belt in the middle of summer days. The old man knew it was here somewhere, but he was too proud to look. I bet if I tried, I could find half a dozen loose boards right now. Some people got uncomfortable talking with Edgar, imagining they would have to turn everything into a question something he could answer by shrugging, nodding, or shaking his head. The same people tended to be unnerved by the way Edgar watched them. Claude didn't seem to mind in the least. Did you have something you wanted to ask me, he said, or was this purely a spy mission? 
Edgar walked to the workbench at the front of the mow and returned with a scrap of paper and a pencil. What are you doing up here? he wrote. Claude glanced at the paper and let it drop to the floor. Not sure I can explain it. That is, I can explain it, but I'm not sure I can explain it to you, if you know what I mean. Edgar must have given Claude a blank look. Okay, your father asked me not to get into too much detail here, but uh, let's just say I've been inside a lot. I got really tired of being inside all the time. Little room, not much sun, that sort of thing. So when I got in that room tonight, even trimmed out and fancy like your mom made it, it occurred to me that it wasn't much bigger than the room I'd been in. And that didn't seem like the right way to spend my first... A bemused look across his face. My first night home. I started thinking maybe I'd sleep on the lawn, or even the back of the truck, watch the sun rise. Thing is, the outside is awfully big. That make any sense? Spend a long time cooped up, you go outside and it feels almost bad at first. Edgar nodded. He set two fingers on the palm of one hand and swept them over his head. Exactly right. Whoosh. Claude swept his hand over his head too. Know what scotch is? he asked. Edgar pointed at the bottle. Good man. Seems like most people get interested in the liquor eventually and they're either going to try it on their own. The bottle of squatch tipped itself toward him invitingly. Edgar shook his head. Not interested, eh? Good man again. Not that I'd have let you have much. Just wanted to see if you were curious. Claude unscrewed the bottle cap, took a sip, and looked squarely back at Edgar. Still, it would be a big favor to me if you'd keep this between us. Not doing any harm up here, right? Just relaxing and thinking, enjoying this place. Your folks would probably end up all worried for no reason. This way, they don't know you're sneaking out at night, and they don't know I went for a stroll either. Claude's smile, Edgar decided, looked only a little like his father's. You better get back to the house now. If I know your dad, he wakes up everybody at the crack of dawn to start work. Edgar nodded and stood. He was about to clap Almondine over when he realized she was already standing in the vestibule, looking down the stairs. He walked over to join her. Here's a trick that might come in handy, Claude said to his back. You know that stair that squeaks about halfway up? Try it over by the left. There's a quiet spot. Not easy to find, but it's there. If you get in the door without slamming it, you're home free. Edgar turned and looked back into the mow. I know that spot, he sighed. We found it this morning. But Claude didn't see him. He had sprawled backward against the bale, fingers mashed be behind his head, looking through the gap in the roofing boards and into the night sky. He didn't look drowsy, more like a man lost in thought. It came to Edgar that Claude hadn't really been asleep at all as they'd worked their way along to get a better look at him. He'd been teasing them, or maybe testing them, though for what reason Edgar could not imagine. The next morning, Edgar came downstairs to find his uncle seated at the kitchen table, eyes bloodshot, voice croaking. He didn't mention their late night encounter. Instead, he asked Edgar to teach him the sign for coffee. Edgar rode one fist atop the other as if turning the crank of a grinder. Then his father walked out to the porch and Claude joined him and they talked about the barn roof. I can start on it, Clark, Claude said. You ever re-roofed a barn? No, or a house. How hard can it be? I don't know. That's what I'm asking. I'll figure it out. That afternoon, Edgar's father and Claude returned from the building supply in Park Falls with a new ladder tied to the truck topper and the truck bed filled with pine planks, tar paper, and long flat boxes of asphalt shingles. They stacked the supplies in the grass behind the back runs, and over it all, they spread a new brown tarp. I hope you enjoyed it. We've introduced Claude, and something tells me he's... He's going to be a handful. I hope to see you next time with our third part of the story of Edgar Sawtell. Have a great day.